So with all of that as background, it's my deep, deep pleasure to welcome Mike Lauer, our Deputy Director for Extramural Research at the National Institutes of Health, back to the FDP. I can think of no one more fitting to join us in this celebratory moment when we're all coming together. He's been a champion of our work, as you well know, um, and tackles these very issues uh, in his own work that I just laid out. As you may know, he serves as the principal scientific leader and advisor to the de uh, director of the NIH on all matters relating to the substance, quality, and effectiveness of the NIH extramural research program and administration. He received his education and training at Rensselaer Polytech Institute, Albany Medical College, Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, and the NHLBI's Framingham Heart Study. He spent 14 years as the Cle at the Cleveland Clinic as professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics. During his tenure at the clinic, he led a federally funded, internationally renowned clinical epidemiology program that applied big data from large-scale electronic health platforms to questions regarding the diagnosis and management of cardiovascular disease. From 2007 to 2015, he served as division director at NHLBI, where he promoted efforts to leverage big data infrastructure to enable high efficiency population and clinical research, and, adopt, and efforts to adopt research funding and culture that reflected data-driven policy, which of course has been the hallmark of his work in the policy sphere for years and years. He's received numerous awards, including the NIH Equal Employment Opportunity Award of the Year and the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Exceptional Federal Service in recognition of his efforts to grow a culture of learning and ac accountability. It is my deep honor and pleasure to welcome Mike to the podium. Michelle, thank you so much, and wow, this is amazing. I, so I, I will admit I took some pictures. Because <laughs> I, I, I mean, I haven't seen anything like this in such a long time. So, congratulations on pulling this off. Maybe we can adjourn now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, congratulations to the FDP, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. Um, so, I, I'd like to uh, share some thoughts with you, um, and uh, hopefully, this will help uh, stimulate a, a good discussion. Okay. All right. So. Um, I believe that when I've met with you before, we've talked about stresses to the uh, research workforce. Um, so in some respects, there's nothing new here. Um, but what I'd like to do is put this within a historical perspective and um, come up with some ideas as to how all this has come about. And um, I'm quite sure that I shared with you um, this paper, and I'm guessing many of you have seen it. How many of you have seen this paper by um, uh, that was in PNAS in 2014 by a number of major leaders. So this paper talked about systemic flaws um, in biomedical research. Now, although I'm going to be talking about biomedical research, you can cross out the word biomedical because I, I really think that um, a number of these themes um, are, are cross-cutting. Uh, and they argued that uh, we're, um, this was back in 2014, that we're in a unsustainable state of uh, hyper-competition. Uh, it is driving young people um, out of our field. It, it is uh, leading to more and more conservative uh, work and, uh, and discouraging uh, innovative work. This is all very bad. And um, around the same time, uh, Judith Kimball and her colleagues published a paper um, in eLife. Uh, they had a series of workshops that were organized by the University of Wisconsin. Uh, on uh, trying to rescue the, the biomedical uh, research enterprise. And they talked about two major problems. And they, they argued that everything else uh, that uh, people were, uh, were complaining about, everything else is in some way um, derivative from these two major problems. So one problem is, is that there are too many scientists chasing after too few dollars. And the second problem is, is that there are too many postdocs chasing after uh, too few uh, faculty positions. So what I want to do first is show you data um, that um, convinces us that these two statements um, are true. All right. So too many researchers going, too many researchers. So what this is, um, this is a plot um, of the number of principal investigators who um, are applying for research grants in any given year at our agency at NIH, and then the number of principal investigators who receive any one award. So let me just walk you through this here. All right. So the, the red line with, with the dots, we go from two, 1998 to 2022. 
Their vertical lines at 1998 and 2003, those represent the beginning and the end of the NIH doubling. And then 2013, we all remember 2013 very well, maybe not so well. Um, that was the year of the shutdown. That was also the year of budget sequestration. Uh, all right, so the red line with the dots shows the number of unique um, scientists who are serving as a PI on at least one application submitted to the agency. So back in 1998, that was about 20,000. Um, at the end of the doubling, that was about 25,000. And now uh, it's running around 50,000. So you can see this red line here, it's, it's you know, been dr dramatically increasing. So that's the number of scientists who are seeking um, NIH dollars through research project grants. Uh, by the way, one thing that's interesting here, you'll notice this big bump in uh, 2021, uh, and then it comes back down in 2022. We actually had fewer applicants. Uh, that's probably a pandemic effect. People are being sent home from their laboratories, so uh, what do they do? They write grant applications. Um, okay. The, um, the, the green line on the bottom shows the number of unique scientists who win at least one award in that uh, given year. Obviously, it's a much smaller number. Um, and uh, it's been increasing a bit uh, over the last few years. We'll look at that in a little bit more detail, and that probably coincides with increasing budgets um, that we have received recently. And then the blue line, that shows the funding rate. So the funding rate is the ratio of scientists who receive at least one award divided by the total number of scientists who are submitting at least one application. We call that um, the funding rate. It's a person-based um, metric. Back in the, uh, the doubling, at the time of the doubling, that was running about 37%. Um, at, the, uh, at the worst time in 2013, it was down to a little over 20%. And now it's a little bit better. It's running around 30%. But what we have is we have more and more scientists um, who are um, applying for uh, research support. OK. Now, so uh, remember the sentence was, there are too many scientists vying for too few dollars. So here is, the, here is our budget. Um, and so what uh, this shows, again, we're going from 1998 to 2022. Um, on the left, on the red lines that with the dots, those represent the, um, uh, the nominal budget. So that's the budget and the, the dollars that were actually stated by Congress uh, back in, oops, sorry. Uh, back in, uh, in 1998, that was like $12, million, $12 billion. Um, and now it's increased to uh, over $40 billion. And then the line on the top shows the, uh, the NIH budget adjusted for inflation. We use a, an index called the Bird Pie, the Biomedical Research Development and, Pr and Price Index. Um, and you'll see during the doubling there was this dramatic increase. So that goes from uh, here to here. Um, and then um, effectively for a period of more than 10 years after 2003, um, the budget declined. So you've got more and more scientists going after fewer and fewer dollars. Now, um, in recent years, and we're very grateful uh, for this, there's been strong bipartisan support for, for scientific research, um, the budgets have uh, increased from 2015 till more recently. Now, uh, actually over the past couple of years, after adjusting for inflation, the budgets have been more or less uh, flat. Um, and where we are now is a little bit below where we were in 2003 after adjusting for inflation. So here's where we are now. Here's where we were in, in 2003, 2004 at the peak of the doubling. Uh, so essentially our buying power is what it was back in 2003, but we have twice as many scientists who are seeking um, support. So more scientists going after uh, fewer dollars. All right. The second um, claim that was made was that we have too many postdocs going after too few faculty positions. Um, so these are data from the uh, NIH NSF survey of, of uh, graduate students and postdoctorate researchers. This shows all uh, postdocs in uh, science uh, and engineering. And uh, what the, um, again, we're going now from, this is going from 1985 to 2020 on, on the x-axis, and then the height shows you the, um, the, the number of postdocs. Now, on the bottom here in blue um, are United States citizens who are men, then we have United States citizens who are women, then we have foreign uh, non-US citizens who are men, and then at the top are non-US uh, citizens who are women. Back in, in 1985, 
Uh, most uh, postdocs were, were U.S. citizens. Now most postdocs are, are, are foreign nationals. Um, and then you can see there, there was you know, this dramatic increase in the number of postdocs until about 2010, 2011. And then since then, um, the number has been uh, flat. So we have definitely more and more postdocs. Now, of course, we all are aware that there's a, um, you know, what's being referred to as a postdoc crisis. Over the last couple of years, the number of postdocs has actually gone down uh, fairly substantially. But nonetheless, we're way above where we were um, uh, some decades ago. Uh, so that's, we have more and more postdocs. And uh, this um, plot, this is from a book that's written by um, Andrew Comrie. It's published in 2021. I think it's called something like, like No One Else's Business. Um, so he was at Aristo Arizona State University. It's a fascinating book, uh, and it's got lots of plots in it, and uh, so I like that. And uh, also it's got um, wide margins. I like that part, too. Uh, so lo lots of pictures and wide margins, and there's also an electronic version of, of the book. Uh, but what, what this shows is uh, data on the number uh, or the change in faculty positions between 1998 and 2018 um, at different types of institutions. So, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. I will eventually master this. Okay, so uh, on the left are R1 public, uh, then we have R2 public, and then here in the middle is R1 private and R2 private. The, the blue lines um, represent the change in the, in the uh, number of uh, professor or associate professor positions. And those have gone down by about 8%. And then these lines, these orange lines, are lecturer and, and instructor. Um, and some people might refer to professor and associate professor as a real job, um, and whereas lecturer and instructor is perhaps a less real job. Um, but what you see here is, is that um, across the board, um, there, there are fewer faculty positions um, at the associate professor, professor um, level. So we have fewer faculty phys positions. There's also data on f uh, fewer tenure track faculty positions. We have more postdocs going after fewer faculty positions. So I think that the claims that were made um, at, by that University of Wisconsin paper that we have too many uh, scientists going after too few dollars and too many postdocs going after too few faculty positions these are both um, you know, well-grounded um, in evidence. And um, scientists are responding. And one of the ways that they're responding is they're leaving academia. So these are um, also NSF data. I took this from an article that was published in, um, in STAT. And it shows the um, uh, over time. So this goes from 1995 on the left to 2021, I think, on the right. Um, and uh, it shows the percentage of scientists in various sectors, PhD scientists. So on the bottom here, um, th these are the percentage of PhD scientists in industry. And, and look what's happened. So in 2010, it was maybe 25%. Now it's approaching 50%, almost a doubling. Um, and then the light blue are the, per are the percentage of PhD scientists in academia. And that's almost halved. So that's gone from maybe 60% to maybe 40% or 35%. Uh, so we have a dramatic shift of scientists who are leaving um, uh, who are leaving academia and going into uh, industry. And then, you know, there are a few people who decide to go into government. I don't, don't know why they would do that, but okay. All right, so uh, how did all this come about? And I want to focus on three things. One is the NIH budget trajectory. I've already shown you that, but we'll look at this again. Changes in uh, the workforce, and then um, inequalities in the support uh, of that uh, workforce. So again, this is the NIH budget. It's the exact same slide I showed you before. And notice the oscillations. So we have a dramatic increase from 1998 to 2003, um, a rather dramatic decrease from 2003 to 2015, and then a less dramatic increase, but nonetheless uh, an increase from 2015 to now, although it's been um, more flat over uh, recent um, years. So I found this interesting paper. It was published in 2008 um, by two uh, prominent economists. And uh, they say, be careful what you wish for. Um, a cautionary tale about budget doubling. And they say, you know, the problem when you have a rapid uh, increase in, in spending is when it ends. Uh, and in, if you think about what happened with the NIH budget, it ended rather suddenly. Uh, and uh, what uh, people get caught, people in projects get caught, 
and these are particularly young people who get caught, who are early on in their career, and so um, they are the ones who bear um, uh, the burden of this, and so this deceleration caused a career crisis for, uh, for young researchers, and um, that's exactly what happened. Now, these are data in which we show the proportion of our principal investigators who are early career, mid-career, and late career. These are rather arbitrary definitions, but um, early career is, uh, is uh, for age, uh, I think it was age 45 or less. Mid-career was uh, age 45 to 60, and then late career was uh, over the age of 60. By the way, I used to tell my patients that um, the definition of elderly is 10 years older than my father. Um, uh, so, um, uh, but in any case, it's very interesting what's happened here, which is that the, the red line, so this goes from, again, 1998 to 2022. The red line with the dot shows the proportion who are early uh, in their career, and that, that went way down. Um, it has, uh, it has uh, been more flat over more recent years. Maybe that's because of some of our early stage investigator policies. I, I'm not sure. Um, the, uh, the proportion of, of uh, supported principal investigators who are late career has gone up dramatically from about 10% to um, over 20%. Um, over the, although over more recent years, that's also um, stabilized. And then the blue line on the top, um, these are the proportion who are mid-career, initially went up and then went down. And this was something we've been hearing about a lot, uh, was that mid-career investigators felt squeezed, that the late-career investigators were doing very well, uh, they knew how to get grants, the early-career investigators were getting a bit of an advantage from the agency, and so the mid-career investigators were being squeezed um, out. Uh, so. Uh, the, the dramatic increase in the uh, proportion of our investigators who are late career um, is coincident with a phenomenon that now has been well described, which is the uh, aging of the workforce. This is a very nice paper that was written by um, Bruce Weinberg at um, Ohio State University. And uh, what they describe, this paper was published in PNAS, what they describe is um, a marked and rapid aging of the uh, science, technology, engineering, and, and math workforce um, much faster than what would be expected just based on demographics alone, just based on the uh, aging of the uh, baby boomers. Uh, and so the, the question is what, why? Uh, it was a very detailed analysis, but they argue that one of the major drivers goes all the way back to 1986. So in 1986, there was an amendment to uh, what's called the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. And what that said was that mandatory retirement in, in academics had to end by um, 1994. So it used to be you had to retire when you were 65. Um, in France, it's 64. And I'm you know, willing to go there. OK. Uh, so um, uh, anyway, um, uh, and so what this led to is a dramatic change in the behavior um, among senior faculty. So what this shows, this goes, um, compares uh, 1993, that's the blue line, and the, uh, the red line is 2008. And what it shows, you go from age 50 on the left to age 75 on the right, and the height of the line is what proportion um, of scientists at that particular age are going through a career transition. Um, and so in 1993, it was much greater because there were many more scientists who were retiring. And now uh, we have far uh, fewer scientists um, who are, are retiring. So they argue that this uh, marked increase in the aging of, of the workforce, um, they, uh, they, they say that um, uh, their major findings are that the scientific workforce has aged rapidly, much more so than you would expect just based on demographics alone, that the main causes have been a decline in the retirement of, uh, rate of older scientists, um, and that uh, these trends imply that there's going to be a substantial increase, that this is going to continue in the age of the workforce. And why is this problematic? Because they're going to crowd out younger scientists. Now, you've got a limited pie. The budget is only so much. And as you can see over time, the budget has gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up a bit. But um, you've got a limited pie. You've got more and more scientists going after, more going after this. And the, um, the older scientists are quite successful, uh, and so the younger scientists are being crowded out. And this manifests itself in a variety of ways. So one thing that we often get asked about is uh, the age at which one gets their first R01. Now, um, as you all know, uh, what it used to be, 
that you could get your first R01 when you were 18 years old, and now you can't get your first R01 until you're 99. Um, and so this is something that we're constantly being asked about, and what's the NIH going to do about this? Um, and um, I, I have uh, argued, I actually uh, met with some uh, congressional staff, uh, and, and I have argued that um, this is kind of like complaining about um, the sump pump in your basement. So your house is flooded, um, your basement's all wet, the sump pump isn't quite, isn't quite doing the job that you expect it to do. Um, so you complain that the sump pump isn't working well, but the real problem is that you built the house in a floodplain. Um, and so this is a phenomenon that I think is a, um, is a uh, consequence of the aging of the workforce. All right, so uh, this is a table. Um, it shows uh, men and uh, the age at their uh, first R01. Um, and so the mean age in 1995 was about 40, and uh, in, in uh, 2020 it was about 44. So it's increased by about four years. But if you look at the 90th percentile age at which uh, men are getting their first um, R01, it's gone from 47 to 54. So it's actually increased by seven years. Um, and uh, this is another way of looking at it. These are distribution plots. You can see uh, both men and women, you can see they largely overlap each other, so there's not really a huge difference here. Um, the line in the middle, that shows the, um, the mean uh, age. Um, and so the mean age has increased, at, although the rate of increase has, has slowed down um, a bit. Um, and uh, you, then you can see this wide tail um, on the right, uh, which represents um, older careers um, scientists. And uh, this uh, breaks it down by degree. Um, so the blue uh, distribution plots are PhDs, the green and the red are MD or MD, M, uh, MD PhDs. Not surprisingly, um, MDs are, are older, um, and that's because they're going through clinical training or the MD PhD pr programs are longer, but the, the trends are, are kind of similar. Now, um, another point I made is, is that what we are seeing in terms of age of, of first uh, R01 uh, parallels what's being seen uh, on faculty. So these are data from AAMC showing um, the age at which one achieves a particular um, uh, rank uh, for the first time. So at the very top on the blue, uh, the, the blue lines on the top, these are men and women when they, you know, the age at which they get appointed as professor. And it's the exact same trend. It's, it's been, it went up from, this goes from uh, 1991 over here on the left. This is 20, I guess, 17 on the right. Um, and, it, you know, it, it went up and then it, it uh, has, um, the rate of increase has slowed down a, a little bit. And then the green uh, here, these are uh, associate professors and you see the exact same uh, trend. All right, now that's looking at first R01. Here what we're going to do is look at all research project grants. Um, and so the average age of, um, of, of all, uh, these are men again, uh, increased from 44 to 53 from uh, 1985 to, uh, to 2020. So that, that increased by about eight years. But if you look at the 90th percentile, it's increased from 56 to 68. So it's increased by 12 years. And uh, this is showing the same data here, but um, instead showing it um, as, um, as distribution plots. So we go from 1985 at the top to 2020 on the bottom. The lines down the middle show the mean. Um, and so these are both men and women. So the men tend to be a bit older. Um, and so the mean ages of the men are a bit older than, than the women. And you'll notice that the, you know, these wide tails on the, on the, uh, to the right. And so now, uh, now what I've done is I've drawn uh, a line down where the 90th percentile is, and you can see that has shifted um, quite substantially to the right. All of this consistent with the aging of the workforce and, and the end of uh, mandatory retirement. All right, so now going back to this, uh, um, to this article, um, they can point out what's the problem when the budgets increase and then suddenly stop increasing. So um, they then go on to say, the way agencies divide budgets between the number and size of research grants will affect researchers' behaviors and research output. So I want to talk about this, about the number and the size of, of, uh, of research grants. So here I'm going to show you the number of research project grants um, that we have awarded. Um, and uh, on the top, the blue line, 
That shows the number of research project grant awards. And then on the bottom, the red line shows the number of principal um, investigators. And it looks exactly like the budget plots. So there's a dramatic increase in the number of awards when the budgets went up. As the budgets went down, the number of awards went down. And then in more recent years, with the budget increases, the, um, the number of awards have gone up. We are now actually funding more awards than we, than we ever have. And we're actually now funding more principal investigators than we ever have. Problem is, of course, we have many, many more principal investigators who are trying to um, get funded. So this is um, uh, another way of looking at this, and that's asking how many dollars does each investigator get? All right, so I'm going to walk you through this. Each, this we're going from 1985 to 2022, and uh, each of these is a box plot which shows the distribution of dollars going to any particular investigator. So if they have multiple grants, that's going to be more dollars. If they're um, a multi-PI grant, let's say you have two PIs on a grant, then each PI gets cr credit for, for, one, uh, for one half. Um, the, uh, the lines in the middle are the median, the diamonds are the mean, the top of the box is the 25th percentile, the, bottom, I mean the 75th percentile, the bottom of the box is the 25th percentile. All right, so this is, you know, you look at this like a work of art, and uh, what you see um, is that it, there's this big bulge, and the big bulge happened at the time of the NIH doubling. Um, so that was a great time to get funded. You know, not only were we funding more scientists, but they were getting more money, and then since that time, um, that number has gone down. Now, the other thing to notice here, you know, you've got the, the whiskers, so the whiskers are, are a reflection of the degree of variation. It's enormous. So it's, um, it's not like every scientist is getting the same amount of money. There's a wide degree um, of variation, or some people might call that um, inequality. And in fact, that's been um, a topic of, of a great deal of worry. This is a, an article from uh, two um, scientists at, at Harvard. Um, they talk about NIH funding has been marked by high inequality and, and low uh, mobility, um, and they uh, uh, bemoaned concentration of resources in, in a biomedical um, elite. So I had the great pleasure of working with uh, one of my colleagues, Devshika Roy Chowdhury, uh, and we published this paper a couple of years ago on inequalities in the distribution of NIH uh, funding for research um, project uh, grant principal investigators. So one way you can think about inequality, you probably heard about this, is how much money is going to the top 1%? So let's say you take, we have like 35,000 scientists who are principal investigator on at least one um, a research project grant in any given year. Take the person who has the most amount of money, put that person on the top, then the second person on the bottom, and then the person on, uh, uh, next, the t second on the top, and then the person on the bottom is the person who's getting some money but getting less than everybody else. And then you, you then split it up into 100 different um, equal uh, pieces, equal by numbers of scientists, and see, all right, the top 1%, how much money is going to the top 1%? If, if it were absolutely even, everybody were getting the exact same amount, it would be 1%. 1% of the money would be going to the top 1%. So back in, in 1998, when, when, the, uh, when the doubling started, uh, it was about uh, 8%. So the top 1% of scientists were getting 8% of the money. And, uh, and then with the doubling, that goes way up. And then it was flat for a little while. And then look at what happened here. Immediately after sequestration, when the budget started going up, there's a dramatic increase. Um, and so it goes from about 8% uh, to 11%. In other words, the top 1% of scientists are going from getting 8% of the money to getting 11% of the money. Now, you may say, well, that's just 3%. That's nothing. It's 3% of $22 billion. That's $750 million. That's about 1,500 grants. So, that's, it's real. Um, and so that means that, um, that there are 350 million, uh, 750 million more dollars going to a, a, a group of 350 scientists. Uh, now, what's very interesting is, is that unlike times past when budgets have increased, um, the degree of inequality has actually decreased uh, over the last few years. And I, I really don't know why that is. It's kind of nice. Um, one reason may be because of our Next Generation Researchers Initiative, and one of the uh, major goals of this has been to fund more early uh, stage investigators. So this shows the number of uh, early stage investigators getting their first R01. Now, granted, they may all be 99 years old, but, um, so, uh, but it, it, it shows um, the number that we funded in any given year. This is uh, 
so I was running around a thousand for a while, then it went down, then went up a little bit. Look what happened in 2013. So 2013 was a really bad year. Everybody got hit in 2013, but it was the early stage investigators who got the biggest hit. Um, and then over more recent times, we, we have a, we've had a dramatic increase, and that's been deliberate. That's been uh, agency um, policy. All right, so who are the top 1%, uh, the, the scientists who are getting um, the most amount of funding? It's about 350 of them, and then the bottom 99% are about 35,000. So one is that they're much more likely to be early, uh, late career. So 46% are late career compared to 24% of everybody else. Um, they're more likely to be men, 69% compared to 63%. They are much more likely to be white, 79% compared to uh, 67%. Um, they're more likely to have an MD after their name, either MD or MD, PhD. Now, um, everybody bemoans physician scientists, they don't exist anymore, uh, but I'll say the few who do exist are, are doing uh, quite well. Um, the, um, uh, and this, uh, some more data on this, they're getting much more funding. So um, the average, the, the person, the people in the top 1% are getting about $4.8 million of funding a year compared to about $400,000 for everybody else. So that's a massive difference. And it's not only that they're being funded on more expensive grants, it's also that they're getting more grants. So 67% of our researchers uh, have only one grant to their name, um, but um, the, the scientists who are among the top 1% are much more likely to have three, four, five, or more um, grants to their name. So they may be getting more expensive grants, but they also are getting um, more grants. Um, there's a neat paper um, that came out from a group of investigators, I think uh, they were at Yale. Uh, this came out just a couple of months ago um, about gender, racial, and uh, ethnic inequalities. And they, they identified a group of, of NIH-funded scientists that they called super PIs who were getting lots of grants. Um, and they, were, they pointed out that there were uh, major inequalities um, in, uh, in the gender and ethnic distribution. Uh, racial and ethnic distribution. This shows the percentage um, of, uh, of NIH-funded scientists who have, I think, yeah, four or more grants, and that's gone from less than 1% back in 1990 to about 4% um, now. It's still a, a relatively small number, but it's been a, a substantial increase. Okay, and then um, another point that, uh, that these um, uh, individuals wrote is they talked about the size of research grants. So everybody's talking about the um, about how much grants uh, cost. So this is a paper that um, Devshika, Roy Chowdhury, Joy Wang, and I published just a few months ago um, about um, inflation. And um, so this shows the, uh, the average cost of, uh, of a research project grant. Um, the bottom line, uh, again, going same period of time from 1998 to 2022, or just 2021, and it shows the um, uh, these are in nominal dollars, and then this is in real dollars. So real dollars meaning inflation adjusted. Look what happens during the doubling. There's a marked increase from about $550,000 on average to about $600,000 on average. And in more recent years, it's been going up, but going up by only um, a relatively small amount. But all this shows you is the average cost of a grant. Um, it's uh, actually a much more complicated story than that. So what this shows, these are again a series of box plots and uh, it shows the distribution of costs for each individual research project grant over a period of time, goes from 1998 to uh, 2021. And um, okay, so the, the average cost, which is of the diamonds, same, same data I showed you before, that's remained relatively flat. But the whiskers show the degree of variation or the degree of inequality. This is again, look at this like a work of art. Step back, notice how the whiskers were getting pretty narrow and then over more recent years, the whiskers have gotten wider. So we, what we have is we have a, a greater a variance or variation in the cost um, per, uh, per grant. And one reason for this may be that the agency is funding many more solicited projects. Back in around 1998, less than 20% of our projects were, um, were solicited. Most of them were um, unsolicited, investigator-initiated grants. So here again, we're going from 1998 to 2021, um, the, uh, 
the red line shows the, um, sorry, the blue line shows the proportion of grants that are, that are solicited. The red line shows the proportion of funding that is solicited. So the proportion of funding that is solicited has gone from 20% to 50%. That's huge. This is a dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, increase. All right, so in summary, uh, what I've shown you is that uh, we have uh, seen the development of a hyper-competitive environment, more scientists going after fewer dollars, more postdocs going after fewer faculty positions, the budget oscillations marked increase from 1998 to 2003, marked decrease from 2003 to 2015, and now uh, uh, an increase. These oscillations have lasting effects. Um, the uh, arguments that have been made by some that the aging workforce is crowding out earlier career scientists and it's manifesting itself in a variety of ways and that uh, funding inequalities, if anything, exacerbate um, all the stresses from hyper-competition. Okay, so I'm going to finish. Um, I, what I've gone over with you is a history going back to 1998. Uh, but in fact, it goes back much earlier than that. Um, this is a report that was issued by the White House, what was it called? Oh yeah, the President's Science Advisory Committee in November 1960. This report was issued just a few weeks after um, John Kennedy was elected um, president. Um, and uh, it was about the, um, uh, the, the, um, the government university partnership. Some of you may be familiar with that. Um, so it says, this report by my science advisory committee, I hope it will be well received. Um, in this great endeavor, the partnership between the government and the nature's, nation's universities will assume growing importance. This is signed by Dwight Eisenhower um, during the last months um, of his administration. Oh, so it's a fascinating report. Oh, by the way, uh, one thing I need to point out to you about this report is, is that um, you can buy it from the U.S. government printing office for 15 cents. <laughs> in the bottom there. Um, so, um, uh, one of the, the uh, items that they debated was whether or not federal grants should be used to support fac senior faculty salaries. And at that time, they weren't. Um, federal grants could not be used to support senior faculty salaries. So they, um, there was a discussion about whether or not this should change. Many are strongly opposed to the use of federal funds for senior faculty salaries. Uh, we need to avoid situations in which a professor becomes responsible for generating their own salary. This would create <laughs> a most unsatisfactory sort of second-class citizenry, and uh, we are firmly against this sort of thing. Now, even though they were firmly against this sort of thing, they went ahead and said, you can go ahead and do it anyway. And we know what happened, and this was actually nicely articulated by Roberta Nass from the University of Texas, this is a book she wrote um, a number of years ago. She said, um, the, uh, the book is called The Creativity Crisis, a fascinating read. Um, the establishment binged on hiring a second class of researchers. The result was to create demand for federal funds that outstripped cash supply, encouraged by fiscal surges, science created a bubble. And we have seen this happen. Um, we've seen this happen. Okay, this is my uh, final slide. These forces are, 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 are enormous. And uh, so, you know, what can we do about it? Um, and I'm not suggesting that any of these are, um, are going to you know, turn the, the stresses around. Uh, we are trying to fund more early career investigators and I think we've been successful at that. Um, we are concerned about so-called at-risk investigators. Um, these are investigators who are one grant away from losing all their funding and potentially seeing their labs being closed down. Um, I think we've been less successful at that. One idea that has been proposed is to uh, cap funding available per investigator. Um, the agency tried that back in 2017. It didn't go well. Um, another um, is to uh, reduce the number of trainees and postdocs. Uh, now, in a way, this is happening already. Um, the number of postdocs is, is already going down. But um, we ha if we have too many postdocs going after too few faculty positions, we should have fewer postdocs. Um, and uh, another is that among our, our trainees and, and postdocs to encourage um, other pathways, the, the unemployment rate is actually quite low. And so they're able to get jobs, it's just not, not um, uh, in academia, and maybe there are other ideas as well. So I hope you found this interesting, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here today.
question. Yes. Um, so we have questions. You can use your app. Uh, if you have not already um, discovered that Cvent allows you to send questions, we have some from the chat. And of course, we have mics in the room. So if you have a question, please come forward. I'm going to start with one that came through yeah, sure. our Cvent app. It says, grants produce new scientists, graduate students, and postdocs, as well as scientific discovery. Can you speak about this aspect of the trends you have described? And that's from Joshua Rosenblum. Thank you, Joshua. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so some other interesting data, I didn't show them this morning, um, are the, the number of papers, scientific papers, this is like the, the most base unit of scientific productivity, um, the number of papers published per year, and uh, what, what uh, um, that, su that are supported by at least one NIH grant. Uh, it's about a, a little less than 100,000 papers per year. And what has happened over time is, is that uh, that number of papers has increased dramatically. And then about one or two years after 2013, you see that number go down. And it goes down by quite a bit. Um, and then over more recent years, it started going back up again. So um, there, is, there is no question that, um, that, the, that the oscillating budgetary environment um, is affecting scientific productivity. We have another question from Cvent. This is from Amanda Humphrey. Do you think that the funding and position pressures on scientists across career stages contributes to hostile workplaces and increased risks to research integrity? What recommendations do you have for the research community to combat this issue? Yeah, that's, that's an, another um, great question. Um, well, there's certainly uh, no doubt that all these stresses aren't uh, helping. Um, there probably are other issues as well, um, you know, the culture of, of uh, certain kinds of laboratories, uh, which is in, in some cases extremely hierarchical, um, and, uh, and so it creates these um, highly asymmetric um, power structures and power dynamics, uh, which unfortunately can lead themselves to, um, to some bad behavior. Um, the competition for grants has become so great that at some institutions uh, it has been argued uh, somebody can get away with some rather bad behavior because they're bringing in a lot of money and, and so uh, people turn their, their eyes the other way. Um, I, I think there, there are many factors contributing to this. There was a really terrific report that was put out by the National Academies um, in 2018 that focused on, on sexual harassment and they talked about two major forces um, that identified institutions where harassment was more likely to occur. Uh, one uh, was the, the general institutional culture, the, the sense of accountability within the institution. Um, and, uh, and then the second was that fields that are um, highly male dominated are much more likely to experience um, harassment. So for example, my field, which is cardiology, continues to be highly male dominated and, and it's a problem. Uh, this is another question that's just come in, um, and maybe you won't want to speak about it as a government employee. Are you worried about the, the current political moment mirroring the conditions of 2013? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another from Kirsten Ness. Do you think the corresponding increase in the number of PhD graduates from private institutions who traditionally were not research focused has added to the surge in postdocs? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And um, uh, we have a, a working group right now at NIH that's looking at, at postdoctoral um, training. Uh, we, we've uh, looked at some of the most recent data from the National Science Foundation. Uh, part of the, the surge in postdocs that, that we've seen, and I actually showed you in that plot, um, is uh, that we, we're, there are many, a larger proportion of postdocs now are, are foreign nationals. They're not um, U.S. citizens. Um, and in fact, much of the drop-off that's occurred over the last few years um, has been a drop-off in uh, foreign nationals coming in and serving as, as postdocs. Um, you know, we're learning, a, 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 I mean, these are things that you probably all know, but um, uh, you know, we're hearing um, uh, about some remarkable stresses that postdocs are facing, including these, um, you know, one-year contracts with at-will termination. So somebody can be doing great work, and then all of a sudden they're, they're out. And if they're dependent upon their position to maintain their visa, um, all of a sudden they have to, to leave the United States. So it's a very stressful situation. 
Yeah, I think that visa piece is really, yeah. really challenging. Yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever had to deal with that, but it's it's yeah. a real heart rendering situation when that comes up. Um, this question uh, from an anonymous um, questioner is, so what is your own top two preferred recommendations or approaches to remedy the problems you've been discussed? Uh, well, <laughs> um, all right. Uh, I, I think one thing is I think we need to be realistic here. We're dealing with some huge forces. So to think that um, the actions of any one agency or any one sector are going to solve these problems is, is not, I don't think that's well placed. But I, I would say, um, I guess among, the, and this is now just my own personal opinion, so please don't read anything into this. This is not the official opinion of the agency. Um, so uh, one is, I, I do think we need to fund more early career investigators. We've been quite successful at this, um, and uh, that's something that we're continuing to push for. Fortunately, we've had strong support um, from agency um, leadership. Um, and then I do think um, another, uh, another thing that we should be doing more of that we're not doing um, very well is funding more at-risk investigators. So if you think about that what, that, what that translates into is spreading the wealth a bit. So it means, what I mean by an at-risk investigator is somebody who is doing perfectly fine work and has submitted at least one application that got a decent score. Um, and so therefore, th these are meritorious scientists um, whom our enterprise has invested a lot in, in many cases, many, many millions of dollars, and all of a sudden we, we're, we're at risk um, for losing them. So these, I think, are two things that the agency can do. One, we're doing reasonably well, one less so, or not so much, um, that, um, that could help to decrease the stress a bit more than, than, um, than what we have right now. But I'm not gonna in any way claim that this will solve, solve the problems. Here's a question that looks at it from another perspective. Aside from publications, does the concentration of funding result in greater research discoveries at the applied and experimental stages? Um, so this is very interesting. Um, there's been some uh, work that's been done on this um, about what uh, you know, small teams and large teams uh, accomplish. Small teams are more likely to come up with disruptive um, discoveries. Large teams are more likely to come up with incremental work, but I don't mean that in a pejorative way. Um, think about the genome project. Um, so uh, per, um, incremental work that, that adds great value to, um, to our overall sense of scientific knowledge. Now, the question is, right now, uh, about 90% of our money, 80 to 90% of our money are going to about 200 institutions. So it's a relatively small number of institutions. Is that a good thing? And I've heard Larry Tabak say, one of the things I'm worried about is that the top 20 institutions will become the only 20. And that's, that would not be a, um, a good state of affairs. So on the one hand, centers of excellence are certainly able to do things that, um, that cannot be done in, in smaller institutions. And on the other hand, um, if, if we have too much concentration, uh, you know, that, then we lose diversity of thought, diversity of perspectives, diversity of, of you know, institutional cultures, and that's not a good thing either. And I don't know what the, what the right mix is, but there's a real worry that, 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 that the increased degree of concentration is, is not a good thing for American science. Thank you. I want to recognize our colleague at the mic. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Susie Allard, University of Tennessee. I'm an Associate Dean of Research. First off, thanks for a great talk. Secondly, I love the app, but it's so nice to be here in person. It's kind of fun to actually stand up and ask a question. Um, I was wondering if the agency has given any thought to coming up with a mature career kind of program where mature career faculty can be um, encouraged to mentor, but not PI, to where they can get recognition at their institution uh, be at a very set rate that's very low, but at that there is that they've been, quote, accredited by the agency of being worthy of being a mentor and to help those at-risk investigators? Um, so that's interesting. It, it reminds me of a couple of things that have happened. Uh, one was that um, my, my predecessor uh, tried to do something called the Capstone Award, um, which the idea was is that that would be your last award, but you would use the award for, um, for mentoring purposes, and um, that, that, didn't, that did not fly. Um, 
But we do um, have a, we have a relatively small program, so-called K-24 grants, which are our mentoring awards. Um, my understanding is, is that um, those awards generally are quite good and, and people are able to do very good work with it, but uh, it's, it's a sm very small part of our portfolio. Melissa. Um, so I noticed in that, well, also, thank you for this very thought-provoking presentation. Uh, so many questions, but the one I'm going to go with um, is I noticed in the chart of uh, faculty positions this really big increase in the sort of non-tenure track yep. traditional positions. Um, and from an administrative office perspective, I'm an administrator, sometimes people hit a sweet spot, right? They're happy being an individual contributor. They're happy like coming to work and doing their job and not taking on a leadership position, not trying to go for that next thing. And I wonder if there is some possibility in the research enterprise to look at a PI of a lab is basically like the CEO of a small business and not everyone wants to do that. Mm -hmm. And can we facilitate the creation and promotion of opportunities to remain in academic research and have a career in academic research that doesn't require taking on that level of responsibility, not everyone may want. Yeah, um, so that, that's, a, I think that's a really important point. Um, uh, some people might refer to them as staff scientists, and we, we certainly have them in our intramural program at, at NIH, and uh, many of them are doing uh, really outstanding work. Um, I believe NCI has a program called the R50, which is um, to support um, staff scientists. Uh, we've actually looked recently at, at our, our data to see how many staff scientists are we supporting. And we base that on the progress reports that come in. You're supposed to identify the role of each individual person, and one of the potential roles is staff scientist or scientist. Um, and uh, what is interesting about that is that that number has gone down dramatically over the last 10 years. Uh, and it exactly parallels that plot I showed of the proportion of PhD scientists who are in, in different um, sectors. So I think it makes a lot of sense, um, and, and that kind of position could potentially be quite, um, quite rewarding. Um, and uh, our empiric observations are that we're seeing less and less of that um, over time. Several more questions now in the chat. <laughs> When electronic submissions were rolled out, deadline dates were split. For instance, R21, R03s, and R01s. Do you think this has contributed to the hyper-competition since PIs might feel like they can submit for many deadlines rather than picking one only? That's from Jessica Moyes. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> but um, but, but I'll, I'll, I will say one thing interesting. So some years ago, we heard about a director at NSF. Um, maybe some of you are here. Um, who, uh, what they did was they eliminated um, deadlines, and when they eliminated deadlines, the, the number of applications that came in declined by, by a lot, maybe it was 20% or something. Um, and so we convened a little group um, at NIH, uh, so well, let's just get rid of deadlines, and we, you know, we can function like a journal. You know, I was, uh, spent a number of years of my life working as a part-time journal editor, and they just kept coming in. And the, we, the articles would come in, we would review them, and then we'd published a few of them, um, and uh, so we could do the exact same thing with grants. They could come in, and depending upon how the calendar works, we'll, we'll get, them, get them reviewed and then do something about it. And to make a long story short, I guess we decided that that was um, impracticable, but maybe we should try that experiment again. Um, it, it, it was um, it's maybe a fascinating insight on human behavior. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here's an interesting question. We're producing many more, sci if we are producing many more scientists and many more are going into industry, is that a bad thing? Um, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, is, is this such a bad thing? So, uh, I'll just speak personally here. Um, so, my wife and I are both physicians and physician scientists, and neither of our sons are physicians, <laughs> um, uh, but both went into scientific areas of work. Um, neither of them are going into um, academics, um, and uh, my, my younger son is uh, hopefully getting a PhD in a few months um, in, uh, in a data-related area. He, has, he will not do a postdoc, he is, which personally is fine by me. Um, and uh, no, I don't think this is a bad thing at all. Um, and, and, w and one important point here is, is that while in, in our enterprise, 
we have a very hyper-competitive environment and people are under an enormous amount of stress. If you look at the unemployment rate among uh, PhD scientists, it's very low. Um, and same thing for physicians, the unemployment rate um, is very low. So th there is great work to go into. There, there's no question about that. Um, it just not, it's not as promising in, in our part of the world than, than it was some time past. What is your view on the degree to which increasing administrative burden of receiving federal funding may be contributing to these issues? Um, so uh, what, what uh, I would say is that I think the forces that are at work here are, are much bigger. Um, however, another important force, and Michelle, you alluded to this, um, is that over time, um, our, our whole enterprise is under increasing scrutiny and skepticism. Um, I'm gonna talk about this at the session this afternoon, but I looked these data up yesterday. Um, more than 40% of the American population think that um, universities are a net negative on our society. Um, that was not the case 20, 30 years ago. Uh, 20, 30 years ago, it was probably maybe 20% of the population um, who felt that way. And that is then reflected in um, you know, the people who are overseeing um, our work. Um, that would include you know, members of Congress and uh, also our various oversight agencies uh, within the federal government who are increasingly skeptical um, of you know, whether our work is valuable, whether we're doing our work well, whether people are being held uh, appropriately accountable. Uh, so I think that that's one aspect of this. These are general societal forces. Um, it does not help when there are huge screw-ups. Um, when the Tuskegee study happened, that created, of course, the whole you know, IRB enterprise. I mean, that was a terrible, terrible thing. And, we, and all these various scandals that have happened over the years, um, one of my favorite ones was the scientist who fabricated hundreds of papers back in the 1980s. I mean, th these, these don't help. Um, I'm not saying that that's the, the major contributor to this, but every time that, that something like that happens and, and there's bad behavior among our scientists, among our institutions, all that does is it just feeds the desire for more oversight and more administration and more regulations and, and more, more doubt um, of, that we're capable of doing our jobs well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's something that's been a little bit of an undercurrent in our discussions uh, yesterday during the executive committee. Uh, and maybe it's something the FEP can do something yeah. about. We think, we think there's an opening there in that uh, scientific misconduct space. Uh, many more questions coming in. Everybody's gotten used to our moderation style <laughs> in, virtual, in virtual FDP, and we have brought it right here to our in-person meeting. So I'll, I'll go through more of these questions okay. if you're willing. Yeah, sure. Willing? Okay, yeah, yeah. here we go. Yeah. Uh, round two. <laughs> To fund more at-risk investigators, wouldn't that require a fundamental change in how grant applications are assessed? That's from Michael Doyle. Um, so I don't think so. And so let me, let me explain this a bit. So uh, applications come in, they go through a peer review process. Um, the peer reviewers assign a score and provide a critique. Um, the uh, agency can fund whatever grants it wants to fund. Uh, we don't have to fund a grant um, just because it gets uh, a good, a, a good it, it's well received on peer review. We have actually funded grants um, that um, do not get discussed in study sections. So, you know, the 50%, uh, the lower 50%, we have funded a few of those. Some of them have actually done exceedingly well. The agency, um, so the agency is required to conduct peer review on essentially every application that comes in. Uh, and it is required to consider a variety of, of criteria for making uh, funding decisions. But we, uh, we can fund any grant that we, that we want to. So some of our, uh, and those decisions are made by our institute and center um, directors. Some of our institutes and centers do not use a pay line. Um, and in fact, about half do not use a pay line. So they can, they can use, they can't be arbitrary and capricious, obviously but they can use any of a wide variety of criteria to make decisions about, about what they uh, want to fund. So for example, with, with our work on funding more early stage investigators, they go through the same peer review. I mean, there may be some slight changes that they'll get reviewed earlier in the meeting or in, in a separate part of the meeting, but uh, for the most part, you know, the peer review is exactly the same. But because these are early stage investigators, these particular grants get flagged as, um, as having higher 
um, priority, and so we ask our institute and center directors to pay attention to them um, and to fund them. So this is something that we can do and would not require a change in law. Um, it, it would require a change in our mindset. Um, but uh, I don't think it would require a change in, in how we actually assess the, the, um, the applications. You know, the, the, in a way, the tragic thing is, is that every, uh, and this was a conversation I often had when I was a, a division director, I would be talking with somebody who would tell me about how outstanding their application was, and I would say, yes, your application's outstanding. There's no argument about that. The problem is I've got too many outstanding applications for the amount of money that, that's, that's in my bucket. That's the problem. Um, and uh, so, uh, so we have many, many outstanding applications that, that we can potentially fund that we are leaving on the table. I'm going to jump out of order um, for those of you who are following the Q&A because I think this follow-up makes sense um, in this context. So there's a question about um, in addition to being administrative burden on all of you, <laughs> When people submit those last minute grant applications, um, we would argue that the quality of proposals suffers in that last minute filing. <laughs> it's an institutional struggle, and sometimes um, we mitigate that by setting internal deadlines. Has NIH considered an approach of broadly requesting letters of intent prior to full submissions that might help to alleviate that problem? So uh, some of our funding opportunity announcements, we cannot require a letter of intent. Um, we don't have the authority to do that. Some of our funding announcements strongly encourage letters of mm -hmm. intent. Uh, part of this is to, um, part of this is to encourage people to think about whether or not they're really serious and do they want to put an application together. Part of this is also to help us with peer review so we get a sense of what the landscape is going to look like and that will help us to put a, um, a study section um, together. Uh, we did a little fun project and I think we posted this as a blog. I, I'm looking at, I'm Megan, I don't know whether you remember, but we did this fun project where we looked at like the, the number of days before a deadline when an application got submitted. We did do that, okay. So, and as I recall, there's no advantage to waiting to the last minute. <laughs> so, um, you know, you think you can make it a little bit better, it doesn't, doesn't quite work that way. Yeah, we, <laughs> we did that analysis at my uh, prior institution and found the same exact thing okay. and started to <laughs> let people know that you don't really do very well when you're at the last minute, but some people try anyway. Okay, how do you balance approaches with funding early career investigators and at-risk investigators with capping funding per investigator and encouraging alter alternating pathways? So I think that by, I mean, we've already demonstrated by, that by funding um, early, more early career investigators, we can, number one, fund more early career investigators and do it without actually imposing a cap. Now, one thing that was interesting, uh, I showed you that, that plot showing the per percent of money going to the top 1%. Every time um, pr previously, when the NIH budget went up, the degree of inequality went up as well. Um, and it increased dramatically from 2013 to 2014 when the sequestration um, ended. Uh, the one exception has been the last few years. So in the last few years, um, the, the, despite the fact that our budgets have been going up, the degree of inequality has actually gone down. Now, I'm not really totally sure why that is, but I think one reason may be that we are funding twice as many early career investigators. That may be um, contributing to that. So I think that what we, we can do is we can fund more early career investigators, we can fund more at-risk investigators, and we can, um, in a way, accomplish many of the same goals without having to actually impose a formal cap. Um, because, again, the pie is only so big. So if we are funding 200, 300, 400 more early career investigators than we, than we would have, that means that there's going to be fewer grants someplace else. It just has to be that way. If we don't fund their proposals, how can we get more experienced senior researchers to pass on their knowledge to early stage um, and developing researchers? So say that again. <laughs> well, I think it's about if you're if you're not funding senior investigators, there's a premise there. Yeah. But if you fund uh, senior investigators, they'll bring along a next generation. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. So this is interesting, and I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, fall back on Bruce Weinberg's argument about the crowding out phenomenon. So you've got um, you know laboratories where there are senior investigators who are 
dependent on more junior people to help get the work done, but these more junior people are in their 40s or, or even um, older. Um, and the, in the old days, they could have been already independent investigators and, and getting their, their own careers started. Um, so I'm not sure that th this may be a little bit um, unpopular, what I'm about to say. I'm not sure that argument really flies. Um, and uh, um, th there has to be a, um, a right balance here. but. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been on the receiving end of some pretty angry phone calls uh, from senior scientists who didn't get a grant funded, and they would say, well, um, you know, because I'm not getting this extra grant funded, that means that there are, you know, fewer junior people whom I'm going to be able to train, except that the junior people aren't all that junior. They're in their 40s or even 50s, uh, and uh, either they're unable to um, get an independent career started or they've, they've given up. I'm not totally sure that, that that works, but I totally respect people who, who feel differently. I think <laughs> I, I would get that. <laughs> Kim Moreland asks, in regard to the 200 institutions that receive most of the NIH funding, is there consideration of the significant investment of institutional resources necessary to support and encourage research? Uh, what would allow that to change? Yeah, so that's absolutely true. Um, so, for example, you know, uh, um, these um, uh, these institutions who are doing very well. This didn't happen by magic. This this happened because of many decades of of investments, of fundraising, of uh, recruitments, um, of making uh, making difficult decisions. Um, many um, scientists, of course, um, themselves have millions of dollars are invested in in their. Um, in their operations to get, get up and going. Then you also have uh, facilities, um, and of course, you know, centers of excellence are able to invest in those kinds of facilities. So that, that is all absolutely true. Um, and I think that is something to, uh, that we, we do need to understand, respect, uh, and appreciate. At the same time, I think what, what for example, as Larry Tabak articulated, that doesn't mean that the top 20 institutions should become the only 20. If they become the only 20, that's a net negative um, for science. Um, so um, there is something that, that something very important that medium and lower, uh, lower resource institutions have to contribute um, to, to the enterprise, and we don't want to lose that, that either. Okay. Does this feel like a doctoral exam to you? <laughs> <laughs> I think this is an interesting question because we haven't touched on this theme yet. Minority serving institutions and underserved minority investigators are largely missing from the R01 discussion today. What are some of the statistics uh, or observations that you have of underserved research res researchers receiving or being included in multi-project grants? So we have looked at this. We've looked at, um, at support for minority serving institutions. One thing that's a little bit tricky is how minority serving institutions are defined. Um, so there are institutions like HBCUs and, and, uh, and tribal colleges that are defined in a very clear way and, and by statute. And then there are other institutions that are defined based on their enrollment statistics. So for example, some institutions that are Hispanic serving institutions, when you look at the names of them, these are not less well resourced institutions. They're institutions that are doing quite well. Uh, but we, we have looked at this and as you might expect, um, HBCUs are uh, are not doing um, as well as, as other institutions. Although in more recent years, and over the last uh, few years, um, it, it's, it's a bit better. Uh, we're not getting many applications, um, but the uh, applications are being funded at, at a higher rate. There are a number of steps that are being taken. Um, so one is uh, some um, capacity building in, in uh, research contracts. Um, so a number of minority serving institutions um, are able to um, uh, to develop various types of facilities um, that would be supported on contract that helps them build up their, um, their research capacities. Uh, in addition, um, our uh, Office of Scientific Workforce Diversity is headed by uh, Dr. Maureen Bernard. Um, there is now a, a more uh, concerted effort um, so that the relationship between the agency and minority serving institutions, we, we have a better, better lines of communication than, than we previously have. But this is clearly a, an area where uh, we, we need to do a lot of work. Lisa. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up on the uh, the top 20 remarks oh, and 
just to note, you know, as we're thinking about the draft research security program standards and other requirements that are coming online, the challenges for smaller institutions and just trying to think about risk versus, you know, administrative burden and cost, um, because I think that that can be really a huge factor. So. Yeah, I agree. And, and I know there are also concerns about um, public access and how the public access policy will, um, will affect less well-resourced institutions. Uh, data management and sharing, how that will affect lesser resource institutions. It's all, all, all true. Very good points. Uh, and here's a question from John Leonard. What role do states and their oversight um, a, and funding of universities play in the research pipeline? Do we need to bring them to the table? Um, that's a great question. Uh, that, um, and uh, 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 I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I think that would be a good idea, but um, uh, it reminds me, uh, I had the opportunity a number of years ago to uh, spend um, a few days um, at the Canadian Institutes of Health uh, Research. And one of the things I learned about Canada, is there anybody here from Canada? Okay. Uh, so one of the things I, I learned there is that the, the provinces play a much greater role in funding research than the states do here. Um, so there are these various provincial research programs that are actually quite large. Um, there's a fair amount of interaction between the, the federal government, uh, so that would be CIHR, and the provincial programs that I think we have here um, uh, in the United States. I thought that, that was quite, um, quite interesting. It's a, it's a somewhat different model than what we have here in the United States. I'm going to paraphrase another question which was connected to the NSF herd. Do you think that there's any hint of a U.S. Uh, higher education sort of com competitive institutional competition that might be driving uh, the way in which they pursue funding at different agencies? In other words, um, do rankings like the NSF herd rankings on research expenditures and other kinds of uh, assessments of the quality and the quantity of research have play a role in how, um, how you receive applications and the funding decisions that are made? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I know there's a lot of excitement about these U.S. News and World Report uh, rankings, and they are good, they're not good. Uh, we're not going to be part of them. No, actually, we want to be part of them. Um, and uh, uh, I, I watched this uh, very interesting um, documentary the, uh, a few weeks ago about, about the college admission scandal, you know, the Varsity Blues scandal. And uh, one of the commentators talked about the U.S. News and World Report uh, rankings that first came out, maybe it was in the 1980s or 1990s, and um, he argued that much of the focus was on um, prestige. Um, and actually, the, the, uh, the French word, uh, the prestige comes from a French or Latin word that means deceit, kind of interesting. Um, uh, it's fascinating, I never knew that. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so it, one of the arguments is, is that it set off um, a whole set of perverse incentives. And those perverse incentives then um, led to the kind of behaviors that, that we saw. Um, a while back, I think, I mean, in fact, maybe with FDP, I showed this paper that, that was written by two people from Penn State. Uh, they talked about focusing on dollars and that by focusing on dollars alone, you're sending the wrong message. Um, and that we shouldn't be talking about our research program in terms of how many dollars uh, we get, but we should be talking about our research program in terms of what we produce, what discoveries we've made, or um, how many um, scientists we have trained have gone on to do, um, to do great things. And, um, uh, and so, yes, I think you know, when the focus is solely on how many dollars you get, it, 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 it creates some, some interesting incentives that, that may lead to some problematic behaviors. The questions keep coming. I'm going to limit it to a couple more, um, but we'll share with you all of the okay. comments because there are so many, and thank you all for sending them. Um, one has to do, the, one is a technical question about voluntary cost share. It's usually not allowed in proposals, but institutions can include institutional resources when describing the ability to run a project. I think there's lots of interest in understanding how that resource page and how the institution's investment in research shapes the, uh, the funding decisions uh, for grants. Okay, I think that's a great question to follow up offline. Yeah. Yep, sounds good. Yeah. And then um, how can you leverage relationships with industry and nonprofit or charity-based institutions to offset the burden on government funding and be able to target this lesser uh, funded populations? Yeah, that, that's a great question. And um, we, had a great, we had an interesting experience with that with the um, Moderna vaccine trial. 
Uh, so this was the trial that, that uh, did, uh, identified the Moderna vaccine as being highly effective for preventing um, serious COVID infection. And as that, um, that was a private uh, public partnership. It's a private pu public partnership that's actually received a fair amount of scrutiny um, recently, and there's been a, a, a fair amount of debate about it. Uh, but um, at the time, uh, as the trial was, was going forward, um, the proportion of underrepresented minorities in the trial was, was too low. And um, I have to give Francis Collins a great deal of credit for this because he, he put his foot down and said, this is totally unacceptable. This is a trial that you know, we're helping to fund. It's a product that we helped develop. Um, we know one, one of the things that was certainly very clear about COVID was that it was an illness that was affecting underrepresented, underserved um, populations to a much greater degree and we need to make sure that this uh, vaccine is being uh, appropriately tested um, in those populations. And so a great deal of heavy lifting happened and, uh, and the result was that in the end, um, the, the trial actually um, did have a, a, a very strong representative um, population. So we, we do have various, um, we have various efforts um, to um, increase um, community engagement. We had the RADx Up project and the SEAL project to um, uh, to increase the level of research that's occurring within uh, communities and within underrepresented communities. We have, uh, of course, the FNIH, the Foundation for NIH that um, enables us to work with industry partners. Um, and um, I will, you know, I'll say I, some of this work has been absolutely amazing and outstanding and it has led to, you know, really great outcomes. Um, in this, uh, um, following the uh, discussion we had earlier um, about scrutiny and skepticism, also generates a great deal of scrutiny and skepticism. And um, there are a number of people um, who have a great deal of influence um, who think that we should be as far away from industry as possible. Um, and you know, they've made their opinions loud and clear. I'm gonna conclude with this question from Christina Stanger. Do you think that the trend towards larger and more collaborative proposals is helping or hurting? in access to funding and some of the trend lines on who's being funded? Um, I, I would say both. Um, we, we do know that, um, of course, team science, is, team science is nothing new, but team science has become um, much more prominent over the last, say, 20, 30 years. Um, and, uh, and some of the work that has come out of, of large teams has, has been amazing. I mean, okay, I just mentioned the Moderna trial, so that, that's you know, an example large-scale networks, consortia, um, that were able to get this trial done within a, a period of a few months, come up with a definitive result. It, it's really um, quite amazing. Um, I do think that you know, the, the literature shows that smaller groups are more likely to come up with highly innovative and disruptive ideas. Um, so it, there were smaller groups who came up with the idea of using mRNA um, as a platform. It was a small, relatively small group, actually intramural group at NIH who figured out a way to stabilize the fusion protein that um, enabled the, the vaccines to be developed. But on the other hand, it was a, an enormous consortium that enabled the trial to happen. So there, there, are, um, there are roles for both. And I think we want to make sure that we are, you know, we are nurturing both as, as best as we possibly can. Well, with that awesome. gauntlet of <laughs> questions <laughs> and interest, we thank you again, thank Mike, you. for your generosity of time here with us.